Welcome to Squeal, episode 8. Nearly there, nearly finished. I'm once again at SAE Barn Bay's beautiful Duality SE Studio. And I can never thank them enough for all the support that they've given me. Today I would like to first off start uh, checking the last few things about the uh, console's automation system, one of which is whether or not there's lag when all 40 channels are active at the same time, because this could be problematic once I start composing the piece, because I will be using all 40 channels at the same time. And then I have a little something which I've prepared at home, and I want to see whether it's easy, quick enough to transpose this, it should be, to the um, console, which is here. And this will actually give me the opportunity to uh, compare, discuss the pros and cons of the old school generation of analog console automation, which is uh, proprietary computer based. So for instance, on the SSL 9000K, which I was using earlier, uh, it's a dedicated computer, which can only work with that console versus the newer generation of analog console automation, which is door driven. And there we go. So the first thing I want to check is whether the system has noticeable lag if you try to synchronize a particular event multiplied over all 40 channels, which normally shouldn't happen, but that will be, I think, a good way to test the lag. So the way these automations work now on the uh, newer generation of analog consoles is via a plugin which mimics a particular set of controls on the console. So it doesn't really matter which type of track you'll insert the plugin on because it's not actually uh, affecting the audio on the recorded track. It's just controlling the uh, target channel on the console. So I'm just going to create in Pro Tools an aux input. And on that particular aux input, which would probably be a wise thing to name as the same number of the that the channel or sound that you're trying to control, but I'll just leave it as aux1 for now. And then you just invoke the plugin, which is called the Delta Control for this console. And there you have it. I'll show you a close-up. When I edit the video, you have a fader. Let me immediately assign it to a particular channel. So there we go. I've assigned it to channel one. And not only can you automate the fader, but you also have access to the usual suspects such as cut, but also EQ on off, which is reflected up here on the screen. Insert active or not active. And then you have the uh, six auxiliary sends, which are named Q stereo, FX1, FX2, 3 and 4 respectively on this console. I don't know if you can see the little yellow LEDs that turn on and off. There. So uh, the thing I always forget is that just like uh, automating any uh, plugin, you first need to tell Pro Tools that you want to actually record automation on a uh, particular switch. So that's done by holding all modifier keys, command, option, control down, clicking on the parameter you want to automate and say enable automation for volume. Let's say I want to automate that. And then I can actually display that particular parameter there. And this is the beauty of DAW-based automation, because uh, then, depending on which uh, mode you have, here I'm in grid mode and I've selected eighth note, I'm therefore able to use the uh, pencil in grid mode and draw something like this. And this is what we have now. 
a fader movement which is in perfect sync with whichever tempo that you've uh, selected. So I'm going to catch you a bit later because I need to pause the video and uh, replicate a particular fader movement, not necessarily this one. I'm probably going to go for a much uh, sharper transition, so probably I'll choose uh, a square type of shape, even though again this is probably even more violent on the uh, actual motors, so I'm going to not have that going for too long. And so replicating that across all 40 channels means that I need to create as many tracks as there are uh, channels because I haven't tested this but I doubt that you can actually have several of the Delta Control plugins on the same track but targeting different channels. Even if you could it would become quite confusing so I'm going to stick with the logical thing of creating 40 aux inputs each one with their own dedicated plugin corresponding to the number. So, catch you later. So as I was programming all of the channels, it suddenly occurred to me that I might have said there were 40 channels on this console, but if you count with me, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, I don't know what has gone through that dyslexic brain of mine, but uh, it's a 48 channel console, not 40, as I might have said in the intro. Okay, so the first thing that's reassuring is that even with 48 instances of the Delta Control plugin active, the system usage reports nearly nothing, 1%. So, it was worth checking because it would have been horrible if that plugin was particularly uh, CPU hungry. So that's good news. So, I'm going to move this out of the way. And I've even included the subgroup faders so that everything but the master fader moves. Here we go. actually shaking the whole console chassis and no apparent lag. Reminds me of the hammers in Pink Floyd the Wall the movie. So no lag this is uh, really good news and uh, now what I would like to show you is the huge advantage of a DAW-based automation. It all has to do with the many different time grids that you can choose to work from. So for instance, if I'm working with bars and beats, like I am right now, then I can choose my grid resolution right down to, oops, right down to 64th note if need be. And what I can also do is potentially, as long as my tracks are tick based, I can then alter the tempo very easily. And as you can see, the events will happen sooner or later, depending on how they were programmed. Now, if we go to a old school automation which is time code based. So in time code we've got hours, minutes, seconds and frames and depending on the country in which you work you would have the second subdivided either in uh, 25 frames which is the case in Europe, Australia and many, many countries, or you might have, such as in the US, a very weird frame rate, which is 29.97 uh, per second. So let's not even go there. Uh, let's assume that we've got the choice between 25 and 30. 
So what that would mean, basically, if I were working on an old school console, that would mean that my events would be able to be uh, placed along the grid, which would be perhaps based down to the frame. And um, I remember clearly that on the Neve console, on the Martin Audio Flying Faders system, you could program the mutes down to the quarter frame, uh, because 1 25th of a second, one frame, isn't really precise when you think of it. Um, and whereas one quarter of a frame, which is a hundredth of a second, 10 milliseconds, in other words, uh, that's a bit more accurate. And I've had to actually program on many, many different productions, uh, muting, palm muted heavy metal guitars, for instance, I have had to program my mutes down to the quarter frame. So um, I have yet to find this information in the SSL 9000K uh, manual. Um, I haven't been able to find what the resolution when uh, editing automation, whether we're able to move the events uh, down to the quarter frame, or if we can even go to uh, down to the subframe. So what that is, is each frame can be divided by 80, so 1 80th of a frame. So if we're working at 25 frames per second, one subframe would be 1 80th of that. Uh, but I reckon it's still uh, more perhaps a quarter frame. As I said, I haven't found that information. So not only with an old school automation system are we uh, having to work with this really horrible screen where you can't visualize anything, whereas here everything you do is immediately uh, visualized. Editing things is as easy as uh, grabbing a tool and maybe boom, uh, deleting a particular section, whereas doing that on any of the old school automation systems is, is just a nightmare. Uh, even just drawing this, which I did very easily, if I were to choose a, a triangular shape, there we go. So obviously I have a ridiculous resolution here, but doing this on 48 channels would take me perhaps an entire day of programming, if not more, whereas here it's done instantaneously. Um, and the other advantage being that uh, when you're working to a bars and beats grid, um, then you have the choice of whatever tempo you want to work with, whereas when you're stuck with working to time code, uh, if you're working at the EBU frame rate of 25 frames per second, then you're, the subdivisions, 25ths of seconds, will only give you access to particular tempo values and your eighth notes, quarter notes, will, will be um, uh, really defined by your uh, time code selection. So there you go. I reckon that's the most important um, change and the blessing of that older computer being all rusty and uh, not being able to work anymore. So another huge advantage I found about uh, working with a doll based automation is that this is my laptop and unlike trying to produce a piece of music like I intended to with the 9000K, where I can't really take that thing home. It weighs more than a ton, literally. Here, I can actually pre-program things on my laptop. And then, this is the part I still need to test out further. I should be able to easily translate, or at least use my pre-programming as a guide when it comes to replicating the movements on the uh, duality. So, for instance, here, what I've done to mimic the 
Larson effects, the feedback loops. I've used the signal generator, which I've set to pink noise. So obviously this on the duality would actually be not pink noise, but more the different sounds that I've identified. And to better mimic this, reflect this, I've ran this through uh, two different filters which are in a bandpass mode and in order to really uh, imitate what I'll be doing with the Larson effects which is to create notes uh, I found out that just one even with the uh, Q set to the maximum value I still couldn't get enough of a particular band so what I did is I simply had one behind the other and there we go now I've I'm able to get a particular note and here we have the different mutes and unmutes obviously I haven't really explored the uh, other possibilities such as automating the fader movement because I don't have a duality SE uh, fader on my uh, computer but this is what my little song looks like so these are all mutes and unmutes and this is what I'll then going to try to replicate on the duality tonight here it goes So some of you might have recognized already what this is about. And if you haven't recognized, I reckon by now you probably have. There, so that's the goal now is to replicate that using actual Larson effects and not filtered pink noise. But I hope you see the what I'm trying to say here is that as I compose the piece on the duality, I can maybe already at home pre-program particular ideas. Uh, and worst things worse, if I cannot import the actual automation curves, I don't think that's going to be possible, then at least I can simply uh, have a look at where they fall in terms of uh, particular bars beats, ticks, and simply mimic the, uh, the onsets of the events and their duration, and it should be very easy. So I thought I'd start with the four note uh, arpeggio, which is probably the first thing that one notices in this song. Uh, so I've rigged channel one with the Insert send, feeding back into the line input. And I always found that by activating the EQ, we're able to fine tune much easier. Obviously, what I'll do in the future is I'll have to install a um, tuner plugin so I can really uh, target specific notes here. I'm just doing it by ear. That seems acceptable. And then I've already pre-programmed the uh, mute switch to Basically, you go like this, one bar countdown, and then this will obviously make more sense once I've programmed the three others. Um, so the cool thing being that I can actually use the total recall system to copy over this note onto the fourth channel, because the pattern goes do -de do 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 so it's do -de do 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 these two notes are exactly the same, so I'll do that now. So about 
five to ten minutes later we have this. I've lowered the click track so we can focus on that. Now what I'm noticing is that it's reminiscent of the first synclavier sequencer, which was notorious for being very poor in timekeeping. This doesn't sound too promising. It just isn't consistent, even though the mute switches are receiving their order to mute, unmute, right down to the tick, which is one, uh, is it 960 or 980? I can never remember. A very precise subdivision of the uh, second, of uh, sorry, of uh, each uh, quarter note. I think it's 960. Yeah, it is 900. Oops. 960 as it goes from zero to 959. So we have a precision of every beat is subdivided by 960 subdivisions. That's how precise the different mute unmute commands are being sent. And yet it's swinging like a toolbox that's been thrown down the stairs. So that's a bit worrisome. Because I, I reckon that's completely random. It's not even like a particular channel will have a specific lag that I can therefore offset. I, I reckon it, it's a different swing every single time I hit play. So that's something I'm going to have to look into, but it's not looking good at this point. Anywho, there we go. We've got our basic little four note Arpeggio, I threw in the filter in there because I found that the uh, sound had a bit too much um, upper harmonics in it. So now it's uh, a bit more mellow to my liking. Oh, God. Yeah, not cool. So now I'm going to work on those 16th notes that happen at the end of uh, each cycle and I'm going to mute the click track. We don't need it anymore. This was just to demonstrate how easy it is to follow a particular grid. So I left a blank channel to make it clear that I've got my four note arpeggio here and here I've created the little notes that ping pong left and right. Um, so I stumbled upon another thing. My tempo is 143.1, which is the tempo of the original uh, orchestral maneuvers in the dark tempo. And uh, I tried, uh, these two sounds are supposed to be very, very short. So I tried to draw them as actual 16th notes but that was actually um, too short for the sound to um, even come through. I'll um, give you an example of what I mean. So if I were to go back to grid mode and make these actual 16th note durations, you probably can't see it properly on the video right now. You'll just have to trust your ears. But there we go. Here we have a 16th note, a 16th note gap, then the other sound lasting a 16th, a 16th note gap, the first sound on the left, etc., etc. If I press play, I've lowered the faders on the four other sounds. And see, only half of the 
notes are making it through. And again, it's kind of, well, not so much random. It seems that these two make it through, even though they're all for the same duration on the left, all for the same duration on the right. The sound only comes through kind of when it wants to. Uh, so in slip mode, I've actually extended the lengths a bit. So I still wanted the notes to have a little gap in between. So I actually have a dotted 16th or close to a dotted 16th. And in that case, all eight notes come through. It should. There we go. It's really a bit random. So if I bring my uh, four faders back up for the uh, four note arpeggio, this is what we've got. And still some notes aren't coming through. Really frustrating. Hmm. All right, looks like I have to extend this one a tiny bit more. So yes, it seems that a tiny bit of fiddling will be necessary. Depending on the tempo, there seems to be a minimal duration for a sound to actually pass through the mute-unmute process, which is a bit normal because any console manufacturer uh, will have a particular slew rate when you cut a sound if they actually really went from signal to silence instantly that would create a horrible click same thing if you went from uh, absolute silence to signal instantly by unmuting that too would create a click so what console manufacturers do is they actually implement a particular slew rate a certain duration for the sound to uh, when you unmute to go from uh, silence to signal and then when you mute same thing it actually ramps down so um, this is going to be boring and I'm, I'm not going to do it here but I, i've already thought of a way that i can actually measure by sending pink noise through um, a fader and simply cutting uncutting and recording the output i'll be able to inspect uh, over how many samples the uh, sound actually wraps up so it, it's probably down to the a couple dozen microseconds uh, but i reckon that's what's at play here the the if i try a 16th note at a tempo 143 the duration is so short that by the time the uh, uh, unmute function has ramped up, it's already ramping back down. Or at least that's what I suspect is happening. There we go. So now I've got this pattern. I can switch to conveniently copy that over. I can switch to a full bar uh, grid mode and simply select that and paste it over here paste it over here so again this is something that if i had to do that on the uh, 9000k i'd probably still be doing it in 2019 uh, there we go Still miss that first note. Whereas here, pass through. Right, moving on. This is still going fast. It, it each time takes a few minutes, which I'm sparing you. Uh, programming the exact note. You've drifted a tiny bit and then programming the actual mute and unmutes. Um, I'm going to skip the part where I would program the, uh, the kick drum, there's a snare drum, so I can easily uh, do that. Uh, this is just repetitive. 
What I want to explore now is uh, the actual um, signature melody of, of that song. And uh, I have some things I, I need to explain as well as to how that can be done. When it comes to creating a melody with a fader, uh, when you include the fader in the actual feedback loop, then you're able to change the pitch. And as I found out with this console, the automation is precise enough, as I'll demonstrate in a second, to actually control pitch. So if we have a very slow uh, melody where the notes are really detached, then what one could do is use a single channel, provided you have enough time between This is a bit like playing the trombone for the first time. <laughs> you can't really tell which note is going to come out. All right? So that's actually possible to use a single channel to play a melody. But if the melody is very quick, then um, there probably isn't enough time for the fader to go from one note to another while the channel is muted. So um, either you opt for legato notes, and I've programmed the melody uh, using just one channel, and I'll play it now. So the moment you start playing, I reckon, eighth notes and then sixteenth notes, etc., uh, there is no time to cut in between each, so you end up with... Because you cannot mute in between the notes, the fader wouldn't have time to change position, you end up with glissandos in between each note, instead of having uh, stable pitch off another stable pitch, off again, etc, etc. So you need two channels for that, which I'm going to program now. Right, so I've programmed the odd notes first on channel 9, and you see two automation lines here. The top one, that's the uh, unmute, mute, unmute, mute commands, and the bottom line right here, that's the actual pitch. So let me whistle the melody for you as we go. So it's still missing the even notes, which will play whenever the odd notes are muted. So we've got... So notice what we're able to do here. We're able to while this note is muted right here, this is where I can actually change my pitch from this note to this higher note. Yeah, it's a thing to get used to is that uh, the higher you go in level, actually the lower the note. So you have to kind of work in, in reverse. So yeah, that allows us a uh, clean transition. So if I play from here, there is no uh, glissando, there is no legato, and therefore we can have clean, uh, stable notes. Right, so now I need to program the uh, even notes, exactly the same principles. I won't bore you too much uh, with that. Now that we understand that the whole trick is to hide the pitch changes while 
the note is muted. So I finished programming the even notes, and again we've got the on off, on off, on off happening on this lane, and on this lane we have the two alternating notes. And maybe to make it a bit clearer, what I'll do is I'll pan the odd notes to the right, uh, sorry, to the left, and the even notes to the right. And it goes a little something like this. And this is something that I've been noticing is that I don't know if it's a glitch from the um, automation plugin or if it's a glitch from the console, but you probably noticed even though this has been copy pasted. So it's absolutely similar throughout. Um, I've been noticing that every now and then it just drops a signal out. There we go, we just had one drop out here, and another one. So, this is really frustrating. I have uh, no explanation for this. Uh, this is happening at random places too. If I were to play it again from the same spot, the uh, missing notes will happen. Maybe not but they definitely don't happen at the same spot. There we go. This definitely was playing the previous time. This was playing also the previous time. Um, so if this happens, if I've only got, uh, let me see here, uh, four, six, eight. If I've only got eight channels running and if already I'm experiencing uh, information dropout, what's it gonna be when 48 are going to be playing. Not a good sign at all. So I brought the other sounds back up and my little programming sounds like this. Oh dear. This is not a good sign. Oh yeah, towards the end I, I stopped uh, dead on a few tracks, but um, even towards the beginning where everything is copy-pasted using grid mode. That's missing notes. So episode 8 concludes on a bit of a bum note here. I have to suss out what's happening. Um, maybe it's a network issue, congestion of data. Uh, I have to check whether other people have reported this on uh, the SSL forum. Um, it is worrying because if I'm having this issue with just eight channels with muting and unmuting happening quite quickly. What about people who actually uh, use the exact same plugins to uh, help with their mix? Um, if some mutes happen to vanish, uh, that would be an issue. So anyway, yes, I'm uh, not ending this on a... I don't have my happy face on, but Nonetheless, I'll soldier on. Uh, if this is an issue that cannot be solved, then this will kind of push me into an area where I'll have to avoid all those beautiful arpeggios uh, that I had planned on programming for the piece and go back to maybe slower paced things so the, uh, the timing issues um, can't be 
so noticeable. Anywho, in the meantime, protect your ears, have a bit of fun with uh, Larson Effects internal feedback loops. See you later.